Welcome to day one of the Friends and Australia Bushfire Science Workshop, Emergency Response at the Time of a Bushfire Crisis, hosted by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC Group of Eight and the French Embassy. My name is Boris Tukas. I'm the head of the Cultural Science and Education at the French Embassy here in Australia, and I'll be the workshop facilitator for today. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Thornton, CEO of the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, for the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Boris. And for all of you who are joining us in Australia today, um, I'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we collectively meet. Uh, I acknowledge all the elders, past, present and emerging, and particularly welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. Thank you, Richard. This webinar is being recorded for later online access. As, attended, as attendees, you will receive an email when the video is available on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website. All presentation slides will also be made available on the CRC website. You can ask a question at any time during the workshop using the Q&A the, the Q function located on the toolbar near the bottom of your screen. We will try to get through as many questions as we can at the end of each of our two panels. Before we get to the first panel, I'd like to introduce three speakers to go over the opening statements and purpose of this workshop. Please welcome Christophe Penot, the Ambassador of France in Australia. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome you at this bushfire workshop. And as we slowly become aware of the impact of human activities on our environment, the dire effects of climate change are clearly visible. Uh, this year, of course, as you all know, the world is once again experiencing severe climate and environmental crisis. On a global scale, 2020, has been the second hottest year ever recorded, and we have seen Australia's forests burn as never before, a tragedy that claimed a heavy toll on this country. Fires in California or Amazonia have grown in number and intensity, and even the southern region of France has been severely hit by fires. So in this context of accelerated climate change, our scientific observations and models warn us that we're going to endure even more extreme events in the future. In mid latitudes, heat wave will probably become more intense and more frequent. And some areas of the world, such as the Mediterranean area or South Australia, are likely to experience increased drought. Because of these challenges, will pose a threat to France and Australia alike, addressing them together will benefit both countries. During the 2020 Australian fire season, a French delegation of firefighters from the General Directorate for Civil Protection and Crisis Management came to Australia to meet Australian emergency services and share their knowledge and experience. These discussions have led to strengthening the technical cooperation between our two countries. And one member of this French delegation, the Colonel Bruno Uliac, que je salue chaleureusement, is with us today to share his experience and discuss possible avenues for further bilateral cooperation. As much as the operational solidarity can be strengthened, our scientific capabilities can also benefit from more intense exchanges and information sharing. Science, of course, is crucial to better forecast the future and take the best decision during the forthcoming crisis. And this is why this workshop is such an ex excellent and important initiative. I would like in particular to express my gratitude to the group of eight and the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC for their engagement and participation in this workshop. 
The researchers we will listen to and learn from during the workshop are leading Australian capacity building efforts in the field of disaster resilience. Thank you, Dr. Richard Thornton, Chief Executive Officer of the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, and Professor Margaret Gardner, President and Vice Chancellor of Monash University and Chair of the Group of Eight, for your active participation in putting up this workshop. Thank, thank you to all of you who have made it possible. France and Australia have a lot to learn from each other, and this is exactly the purpose of the workshop, to share our tools, our knowledge, and our strength in order to respond in the best possible way to the forthcoming global changes that will affect us all. Thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I'd now like to give the floor back to Dr. Richard Thornton. Thank you all, um, and thank you, Ambassador, for the kind words at the beginning. Um, I would just like to start off by giving a, just a brief overview of what the CRC is about, for those of you who are not aware. Um, the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre is um, a, a major research centre that, that exists in Australia to look at the broader issues of natural hazards, but clearly bushfire is front of mind um, as we come out of last year. One of our aims is to grow the networks of researchers that can start to address some of the complex problems that we are seeing and the problems of the future, particularly around the impacts of climate change, changing demographics and changing environmental factors. <clears throat> We've always tried to link um, the researchers in Australia with those overseas, and this was a, another great opportunity to do that. When we started these conversations um, way back um, begin in late uh, 2019, I guess, um, we had anticipated something looking like a physical get together. Um, we've now got to the stage where clearly that wasn't going to be possible, so we've, we've turned it into a virtual three-day event. That comes with it a bunch of constraints, uh, which we'll try and work through as we work through these things. But what we want to do is build upon um, the, the long history of research in both Australia and in France, um, and the long history of dealing with wildfires or bushfires, um, in both um, countries. Um, we, through this session, we try to work through a, a collection of, I guess, uh, potential topics of areas where we think there are opportunities to, to collaborate, but clearly that's not an exhaustive list. We've, we've had to be, um, we had to choose um, from various groups. Following this, three days, we'll be reaching out to everybody who registered with a survey which um, we will be asking you for your areas of interest of where you might want to collaborate um, so that in the future we can organise much more focused workshops around um, how do we collaborate. The last session on day three um, will provide some um, insight into what mechanisms might be available to, to enable that, whether that's through funding from the European Union, uh, whether that's from um, initiatives in, in Australia as well. So stay around for the three days. I think it will be not quite as interactive as we would have liked, but uh, by, by all means use the Q&A button to ask questions. Um, and overall, enjoy the next three days because I think there's, there'll be some great talks and great discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. To end the opening statements, I'd like to introduce Professor Margaret Gardner, AC, President and Vice Chancellor of Monash University and Chair Group of Eight. Thank you, Boris. And um, let me thank all of the participants who are online and are giving of their time and commitment uh, to this very um, important example of collaboration in how we might deal with something so significant to our, our future and our future resilience as communities. Um, let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in Australia uh, and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. 
Um, I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, His Excellency, the French Ambassador to Australia, Mr. Christophe Henault, and uh, also the CEO of the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre, Dr. Richard Thornton, but also to the colleagues of uh, in the French Embassy who have been so important to bringing this group together and, of course, to the very important work of the, the colleagues who work through in and through the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC. I know that this is a great opportunity to bring researchers together. Researchers from a group of eight universities, and, and you know, we, we are a particularly research intensive group of universities, but research colleagues across Australia uh, and across France to, to look at how we can extend our knowledge and capability in addressing bushfires. Um, and that is actually the basis of this work, uh, of this whole workshop and why the Group of Eight is so um, happy to be involved. To improve that capability, to know that the way we improve our capability and our responses uh, to this particular issue and many others is by knowing that knowledge has no borders. It works across countries and it is at its best when it's um, Given, given wings, if you like, by international collaboration, by experts talking with experts across boundaries and sharing what they understand and what they could do next in terms of how they discover and, uh, and in fact, give life through practice and translation to their knowledge. We know in Australia, um, we have, if you'll excuse the metaphor, burned into our memories. Um, the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, the Black Summer fires that resulted in the loss of 33 lives, 300 homes destroyed, but indeed billions of animals killed and displaced and extensive damage to um, species and the whole natural environment. And I know that France in late 2019 also experienced uh, in its south significant um, bushfires or wildfires. Indeed, one has to say that bushfire seems a relatively tame word for what we actually have seen and experienced and what we are now seeing uh, on the west coast of the United States, the conflagrations, which are the combination of, of a very dry and hot uh, environment that causes an explosion in the natural environment and is engulfing the, the whole place and way that people live. So if we have ever needed ways of preventing these sorts of conflagrations, conflagrations which, go, which are actually embedded in climate change, but which go to how we build models to work and prevent and also to mitigate and then to repair where it occurs, the really significant damage that happens to people and environments. We need it now. <laughs> we, we need all of your expertise now. In January in Australia, um, in the midst of the, the most recent bushfires, the federal government through the Minister for Education, Dan Ten, called on the Group of Eight to say what capability and exp expertise they could provide. Um, and indeed, Universities, as they often do, move to immediate assistance, everything from providing accommodation for people who'd been burned and displaced from their housing through land to house animals that have been, uh, been moved, trauma counselling services for firefighters and members of community, um, everything through to storage facilities for grape growers and winemakers affected by the bushfires, particularly those in South Australia. And I know that France and Australia share a particular love of, of wine and viticulture. And the other thing that everybody did immediately was crisis grants for affected students. But that moved immediately from that crisis response to actually building in and drawing on the research capability for short and medium term assistance, guides for health risks, expertise for how people could deal with the effects of smoke on all sorts of, and again, we could go to wine and viticulture, but to a whole range of other environments. 
assessments of the implications on threatened species, community trauma toolkits, the whole expertise that we are going to delve into over this workshop in terms of environment, ecology, the technology that could be deployed for mitigation, uh, in my own university, the use of drones, um, optical and radar observations about fire movements, not surprisingly, the whole range of what needs to be done in the health and medical area, and that is not just the immediate physical, but of course, mental health, grief and trauma services as well. And then the longer term planning, the community engagement, the building of resilient environments to deal with this, all that research has been important. And late in 2020, the Group of Eight contributed to the development of the Bushfire Research and Technology Capability Map, which was released in June by the Office of Australia's Chief Scientist. I know that expertise has been central to the collaborations that have been built across countries in dealing with this phenomenon. One of probably the things we see as the touchstone for actually recognising, among many others, climate change, these conflagrations are the things that show people what has been happening and what we need to contend with. I want to commend everybody who's been engaged in the research, all those who've contributed to the immediate um, work that needs to be done to deal with, um, resolve and mitigate the, the fires that have been happening in so many countries around us and which we in Australia live in some fear of in this coming hot season. But it's the ongoing research, the way we might innovate to prevent. Um, it's the prevention we're looking for, much more than the, much more than the mitigation. I think the prevention of the scale of what we've been dealing with. So I want to say thank you to all of you. Um, you are making a major contribution to how we understand how we live effectively. In this, on this planet that we are inhabiting and doing indeed so much damage to over time, you are really important to communities having ways of living effectively in these environments that, that are so sensitive and so open to these situations such as bushfires and wildfires. Um, it's great work you do. I commend your collaborations. I want to thank the colleagues and particularly the French colleagues who've engaged with us. And to say one small thing as I close, um, I note with some envy the, uh, the announcements out of France about the investments in research that are being made uh, and promised uh, in, in the coming years. And, um, and I wish you well with them. And, uh, and, and I hope that your um, example is catching. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. And now let's begin our first panel that focuses on innovations and collaboration from responders' perspective. To chair this panel and the following Q&A session, please welcome Professor Matthew Gilliham, Director of Weight Research Institute, University of Adelaide, Group of Eight. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Gilliam, as introduced. I am Director of the Weight Research Institute at the University of Adelaide a member of the Group of Eight. At the Weight Research Institute, where we focus on creating agricultural impact through research and innovation, and more broadly across the University of Adelaide and the Group of Eight, we've continued our support for the local communities exposed to the devastating fires this past season. Um, with reference to us, that was particularly focused on the devastating fires of the Adelaide Hills and Kangaroo Island at the beginning of this year. So for our activities that we've been involved in, some of which, uh, which were just mentioned, particularly the impact around the wine industry, the fruit growers, fruit processing, making wine, removing smoke tape from wine or storing produce from affected landowners. We did that at the university uh, facilities. And we've also been involved in clearing damaged land and reinstating irrigation, which was the immediate priority for many of our growers around the regions. Furthermore, a number of our researchers are involved, involved in advising on the management techniques that can be deployed to aid these industries in recovering 
from the fires or minimizing their impacts through both early interventions and the longer term. However, today I will chair this session on the more immediate response to the recent bushfires, the experience of the responders and how they draw on innovations built from research to effectively combat the threats. We have three distinguished speakers for this session. Each will speak for 10 minutes. And after the third speaker, we'll open up the session to questions from the audience in a discussion format for the final 20 minutes of the session. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the session, Colonel Bruno Uyak, from the, the head of um, the European and International Relations at the General Directorate for Civil Protection and Crisis Management, a division of the French State um, Civil Security Service. Throughout his career, spanning now over 40 years, Colonel Uliak's responsibilities have included coordination and organisation development for fire and rescue services, analyses and cooperation for civil protection programmes and operational response as incident commander on various emergency situations, including, of relevance today, forest fires. Colonel Uliak was head of the delegation of French firefighters dispatched to Australia to study and assist with the response to the fires this past summer. And today he will give some reflections from his recent visit and also drawing upon his immense experience. In particular, he will highlight the important role for international collaboration in aiding responses. So Bruno, please, can you start your presentation? Thank you, Matthews. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, all the people that attend this conference. Uh, special thanks uh, to the French ambassador and the French embassy with a special uh, through uh, to Marianne. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present uh, forest fire management in France. I would like also thanks my Australian colleagues who welcomed uh, me last January during the, the terrible uh, fire season. Uh, you really did a great job, guys. Of course, I have a, a, a food for my uh, American colleague, uh, actually. Um, as you can hear, I am French, and uh, I'm sure at the end of my presentation, uh, you will love my Franklish accent. So um, it's quite difficult to to summarize the French doctrine in 10 minutes, but I will try to do it. Um, as you know, all the wildfire and forest fire are initially uncontrolled events. Uh, an important challenge for suppression agencies is the decision-making process that informs the selection and utilization of appropriate strategies, tactics, and techniques as well. So in France in uh, 1986, after a very, very bad season, forest fire season, uh, we set up an harmonized national doctrine for the wildfire and forest fire suppression. Um, the doctrine is based on two fundamental principles. First, the need for global and holistic approach. So the first principle is the need for global and holistic approach to forest fire including an appreciation of the fact that the prevention and suppression are inseparable. We cannot, um, cannot separate uh, the two concerns of the prevention and suppression. The second principle is the importance of anticipation and planning to improve management of the forest fire. Uh, the doctrine also outlines four key objectives which are first, prevent fires, second, to develop techniques for suppressing forest fire in very early stages, third, to avoid catastrophic fire and their resulting consequences, and the last, to rehabilitate area burned. The success of the suppression operation is dependent upon the speed and composition of the strike force, of course. All the firefighters know that. But the safety of people and the protection of property is always the key concern for suppression operation and suppression tactic, of course, will be implemented to achieve this goal above any other. So in France, the principal concern is safety, people, safety of people and protection of property. 
In order to avoid catastrophic fire that pose the greatest uh, risk to life and property, the doctrine prioritizes the coordination of the massive attack. This massive attack will usually involve the coordination of substantial aerial and ground resources to intervene quickly and to rapidly extinguish fire before they develop into catastrophic events. So the, the, the first response is always massive attack on the ground and uh, with aerial means as well. Is there are a number of simultaneous fires within an area, resources may actually be separated from a larger fire to assist in suppressing a recently initiated smaller fire. This is uh, the, the, the main uh, objective inference. Why it is difficult to precisely evaluate the impact of the doctrine, there is an evidence that there have been improvement to suppression tactics since its introduction in 1986. The statistics show that 95% of fire burn, fire burn less than five hectares, among which 83% of the fire burn less than one hectare. In add, less than 1% of the fire during the summer season, it's a, the, in, the inverse with Australia, summer season, we are in the summer season now, 1% uh, of the fire during summer season exceed 100 hectares, so only 1%. In conclusion, in conclusion sorry, numerous factors contribute to the success of the strategy. Thankful and joint multi-agency prevention measures, development of a close relationship between stakeholders, a precise daily evaluation of the risk with the use of the fire weather, weather index as uh, all the countries, early detection of fires, preventing, preventive mobilization of suppression resources, rapid deployment of suppression units, a priority for massive attack Again, recently initiated fire, as I just uh, talked about. And at last but not the least, an aggressive and flexible attack of fire. This is a, a, a very short presentation of the French doctrine. I think I, I did around a 10 minute presentation. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, give the floor to, the, to Matthews and um, I will probably come back uh, uh, to the question part. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Bruno. We certainly will come back to you for some questions during the discussion. I'm sure there'll be um, uh, questions from the floor on that uh, presentation and we'd value your input to the general discussion. So next up, we have Dr. Stuart Matthews, Principal Project Officer with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. Stuart joined the RFS in 2015 after 11 years at CSIRO Bushfire Dynamics and Applications. While at CSIRO, Stuart led the development of landscape fuel moisture models to aid in the prediction of fire spread and planning of prescribed burns. He also contributed to understanding the effect of climate change on fuels and fire risk. The RFS, Stuart is responsible to, to, for developing tools and systems to support fire behaviour predictions, including an ensemble modelling system. He has also been closely involved in supporting research projects to develop improved fire behaviour models. Currently, Stuart is leading the RFS contribution to the implementation of the Australian Fire Danger Rating System. Today, Stuart will discuss these initiatives in his presentation and the broader context of the recent fires and how this informs our future behaviours. Stuart, please could you take the virtual floor? Okay, thanks Matthew. And just checking that you can hear me okay? Yep, so the New South Wales Rural Fire Service is a response agency. So we're, we're users of science more than we uh, that the we conduct a lot of research. So this talk, I'll reflect a bit on some of the ways we've used science during the past fire season, but also talk in a little bit more detail about the fire danger rating project um, that I'm involved in, um, in a little bit more depth. So the 1920 fire season was um, by almost any measure, the, the worst fire season we've had in New South Wales since there've been records. Uh, five and a half million hectares burnt, 26 live lost, Lives lost, almost two and a half thousand houses destroyed, uh, and you know, immense damage to to, um, to forests and, and and animals. And you can see there that 
most of those fires that did that damage burned in the eastern half of the state, the forested area. Um, and it was an extraordinarily long fire season. So the, the fire season in New South Wales uh, starts in the, the southern um, spring in the north of the state, those fires in red. Uh, so we had fires burn at emergency levels in, in August. Um, and it, it then moved south uh, over the course of the summer and, and didn't really wrap up until well into February. So it was an extraordinarily long fire season. Um, and uh, as well as having a very large number of fires, we had uh, a lot of fires going at the same time. Uh, at, at one time, uh, that peaked with uh, 17 fires at emergency warning, which is our, our highest level of warning uh, at the same time. So it, it got to the point that in the operations center, we had to change the warning board to a smaller font size to feel, fit all the warnings on the screens. So it was, it was a horrible season, um, but it, it, it's also a great learning opportunity. So the, this, um, this season will, will be the genesis of lots of really interesting research uh, and hopefully improvements in future. So the section that I work with and one of the areas where we apply a lot of science uh, within the, the RFS is in fire behaviour predictions. So the, the fire behaviour analysis uh, unit operates out of headquarters, but we also deploy people out closer to the fires into our operations centres. So that shot on the left there is, um, is our state coordination centre, where the fire behaviour analysis unit is based. And our fire behaviour analysts have an important role in planning operations, in doing, making predictions of once fires start, uh, where they'll spread and how they'll behave. And our analysts use a, a range of tools, um, including things like weather forecasts, fire behaviour models, fire simulators, uh, and also a, an, an understanding of fire, fire behaviour science. Uh, and some of those um, areas of science that we make use of in operation coming out of research that's been done by some of the speakers that you'll hear from in the second session today. So the, the role of the fire behaviour analyst is to take the weather forecast, maps of fuel, an understanding of where the fire is, an understanding of the fire behaviour science and put that into building a prediction. And that prediction process is, is, not, is not mechanical. Although we do use uh, computer-based simulation, there are aspects of fire behaviour, particularly interaction with the atmosphere, uh, things like the development of pyrocumulus clouds that aren't captured in the current generation of uh, of simulators, at least that are available for operational use. And so there's, a, there's um, an, an element of, of understanding of, of the science and how to apply it that's very important there. So one of the, the, the main products that we produce as fire behaviour analysts is the fire spread map. Uh, this is just an example of one for the Duns Road fire, which was a very large fire that burned in uh, southeastern New South Wales last summer. And, uh, and this is a typical fire behaviour prediction in that it's a hand-drawn map showing where we think the fire will end up over the next three days. So producing that product um, bring, brings in a lot of different aspects of science. So it relies on the weather forecast. It relies on mapping of fuels. It relies on models for how fire will spread in those fuels given the weather. Um, and then it requires some understanding to put all that information together. Uh, to, to produce um, a, a prediction of where the fire will go. And those predictions are, are used to, to help in the, the management and planning for the response to the fire. So understanding where the fire will go, where it'll end up at certain times, we can look at where the response needs to be directed and also understand what tactics and strategies might be appropriate or, or not appropriate at different stages of the fire. Uh, it's also useful for generating warnings to the community that they be impacted by that fire. The, the fire behaviour analyst, as well as doing this prediction product, which is probably what we're, we're best known for, um, we're also concerned with providing advice to firefighters around safety as well. So one interesting research project um, that was done collaboratively with a researcher uh, from France, Sebastian Lahey, who I think is on the conference, so g'day Sebastian, um, who was out here at the University of New South Wales a few years ago, was looking at what conditions were associated with entrapments of firefighters uh, responding to bushfires. And that work found that large fires, forest fires and, and fires with a wind change were the, the most likely to cause entrapments and the most dangerous for firefighters. Uh, so that 
uh, research is, you know, is, is immediately applicable that we can, if we're doing a prediction, if we can see those conditions are likely, then, then we, can, we can make a warning and, and ask the, uh, the firefighters in the field and their, their commanders to, to be on the lookout for these kinds of conditions and the potential for entrapment. So scientific research here um, can uh, uh, really uh, help to improve our response and firefighter safety as well. Something new that we did over the last fire season, um, which has never been done before in, uh, in New South Wales and, and rarely around Australia, we're sharing our predictions with the public. So the, the fire spread map that we produce like this are usually used within the service. They're quite a technical document. They require uh, quite a bit of interpretation uh, to make sense of. So something we did differently this season was these public uh, red maps. So this map on the left shows uh, in grey, all the active fires in southern New South Wales at, on, uh, on New Year's Eve. And then it shows prediction uh, for the day, showing where we thought the fires might spread to in red. And also some dotted areas of where there was potential for spotting and uh, potential for the fires to spread if we didn't, if we'd, if we'd under predicted a little bit with our main prediction. So this was shared through the news media, through press conferences, uh, through our social media and receive pretty good engagement and help people to understand not just that there were fires in the landscape, but areas that were potentially at risk. And you know, product, production of those re required a large effort. It required pulling together all the individual predictions for each of those fires, putting it together in a, in a very simple way, um, along with some simple messages so it could, it could be uh, communicated and understood uh, by the public. But it was, yeah, it was well received and it looks like it's something that um, we'll be doing in future. Something else informed by that was also, uh, and again, something fairly rare in Australia, was that uh, the, the following Saturday, we had a, a, a tourist leave zone for the, the coast that was affected by those fires. So again, based on the, on the fire weather, on the predictions of fire behaviour, we looked like those fires could do a lot of damage um, and want any more people in that area than absolutely necessary. Uh, and so there was a, uh, that recommendation for, for people to leave if they didn't need to be there. Again, based on the, based on the fire behaviour science, the weather and so on. So I might just change tack now and, and talk a little bit about fire danger ratings. So uh, 2009 was a, a terrible fire event, a fire event in Victoria, uh, Black Saturday in February that, that killed um, over 200 people, damaged a whole lot of properties and um, the resulting inquiries out of that, there was, um, now, a request to, to look at the fire danger rating system, particularly in giving better warnings at the upper end of the system. So as a result of, of that event, the fire danger rating system, which had previously gone from low to extreme, was revised with uh, a couple of extra categories at the upper end. So we added as well as extreme, severe and catastrophic in most of the country, code red in, in one state. Um, and so that was a quick, that fix was done very quickly. Um, so we get, had a bit more information at the top, but there was a recognition as well that the fire danger rating system was developed in the 1960s. A lot of the science that was used there was a bit out of date. We learned a lot more about fires in the ensuing 50 years. Uh, and really um, it, it'd be better to have a, a more careful look at how the fire danger rating system worked. So over the last uh, three or four years, I've been working on a project to kind of company come up with a fire danger rating system that is uh, using up-to-date science and providing uh, better information to the public to help with their decision making. So one of the things we've done there is to try and bring the fire behaviour science used in the models up to date. So the, the old system used just a grass and a forest model for the whole country um, based on work done in the 1960s. So the first thing we did was we brought the modelling up to date uh, using these eight models that are developed more recently um, by uh, CSIRO and universities and to apply them across the landscape to more accurately uh, represent the diversity of fire behaviour that we get across the continent. The other thing we, we wanted to do was to look at how we define fire behaviour. So the old system had these levels, low, moderate, high, extreme, um, but no really precise definitions of, of what they meant. Um, and so it was quite difficult to look at a fire danger rating prediction for the day and say, well, did that make sense or not? Um, so in consultation with scientists and fire managers around the country, 
we came up with some more detailed definitions. I don't expect you to be able to read the right panel of the slide, just to note that there's, there's a lot of information in there. Um, and these, uh, these six uh, descriptive categories ranging from um, aids to, to have a fire, uh, through prescribed burning, through typical wildfires, and then up to the very worst cases where it's not safe for anyone to be near the fire. Uh, so um, we then put those things together to come up with a fairly complicated computation system that draws in um, vegetation mapping, uh, weather, uh, understanding of drought, all those fire behaviour models to produce some quite detailed predictions of, um, of fire danger categorised into those categories. And the next step then is to, um, is to communicate that successfully with the public. So as well as the scientific research we, that we've been doing, um, there was also some, uh, some social research done to look at how people understood and, and made use of the current system. And what that work found was that people generally didn't understand the current system. Um, it had seven levels in it. They, they, people were confused even within fire agencies about you know, the, the nuances between severe and extreme. Um, a word like catastrophic doesn't do well in, in languages other than English. So as well as the, some of the science being a bit old for the fire danger rating system, um, we weren't communicating it well, well either. Um, and so as part of the implementation of the system, we'll be going to a simpler way to communicate with the public, looking at something with, with four levels um, and some of the details of the, the actions and the names are, are still being worked out. Um, Recognising though that, that uh, fire agencies still need to make complex decisions based on a lot of detail, four levels is not enough there. There's also a continuous fire behaviour index to inform that decision making as well. Um, so this project is currently in the implementation phase and we're looking at going live with it in the winter of 2022. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Our last speaker in the session is Alain Schlepcevich of the Victorian Country Fire Authority. Alain, after his master's degree, initially worked as a forester in Croatia before emigrating to New Zealand in 1995, where he worked in fire management with the Forestry Corporation and at the New Zealand Forest Research Institute. He has subsequently worked at Forestry Tasmania in the Department for Sustainability and Environment in Victoria and has been at the CFA since 2012, where he is currently Executive Director of Bushfire Management. He is also the recent past president of the International Association of Wildland Fire. Today, he will talk about the CFA responses to the 2019-20 fires and reflect on these and the role of innovation in combating the threats of bushfires. Alan, the floor's over to you. Thank you and good afternoon. Just to check that you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, oh, that's perfect. Okay, uh, I, I could have pretty much repeat what Stuart was doing in the first part and, and show very similar way that uh, our fire season panned out and how we utilize the science to, to make other things. But I've taken just a slightly different sort of a direction here. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the innovation in collaboration in the context of, of science and knowledge. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sarah Harris, uh, uh, CFA's manager, research and development in, in helping me for this presentation together. Um, CFA is sort of trying to reverse the trends from the last two to three decades where we sort of um, sort of almost contracted all of the uh, scientific work and the research and trying to uh, rebuild the capability and capacity within the agencies to uh, undertake the research, but also to uh, you know, strongly collaborate with, with other research providers, university, CSIRO, Bureau of Meteorology. And currently we are involved in about 40 different projects uh, as the organization. And I'll apologize because I'll go through a number of slides with the different projects, but I, ca I cannot cover the whole lot. So I'll miss some of the collaborators in, in that space. So, and why we're doing it is uh, essentially we, we're doing that to improve our decision making in order to provide for safety for communities and, and our members. So, and some practical examples will be that uh, uh, those research capability is also acting as a predictive servicing capability that Stuart mentioned. And we also then utilize the science, not just that we, uh, we acquire, 
by science and, and the research that is done around the world and bring that back into the organization to improve our policies, procedures, our doctrine, uh, our training. So, uh, you know, improve our equipment, our tools, protective equipment, protective uh, 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 PPC. So, uh, so some of this work is done in, in uh, collaboration or cooperative way through CRC. Some work is done directly with, with different organizations. So we're doing quite a bit of work in a, in a climate change uh, you know, the space because uh, Sarah came from from Wadash University and and where, where she uh, worked strongly in the climate change uh, space. So we we utilizing that work now to uh, look what you know the changes that uh, happened to us over the last 50, 60 years, but also then we we utilize that to uh, predict. You know, the other how the climate will or the or the fire weather will change for Victoria uh, up until 2100. So the work that we're doing in, in collaboration with the Desert Research Institute from uh, Reno, Nevada, United States. In you know, the, what's coming out of that that work is how the fire seasons are changing for us. So it's obviously the fire seasons are lengthening. We have a early starts of the season. And then we have the impact of all of that on how the plant burning window is changing for us you know, as well in, in Victoria. So what, with that information, then we look uh, you know, where the window opportunities is shifting, how we can still undertake the burning if the window is shrinking. So for example, the nine time burning operations. So we ex you know, are experimenting or, or trialing technology utilizing the drones, ARPES, for uh, igniting plant burns and, and monitoring those burns overnight uh, and also the other, during the day first and then we'll move into the night operations to provide for safety of, of our people. Then we also are working with the Bureau of Meteorology on uh, uh, better seasonal fire prediction tools and that work will feed into, into the Australian fire danger rating system that, that Stuart was talking about as well. So looking at all the climatic drivers, what's the impact on, on our season? Then we bring that back in the organization where predictive services uh, will get information then compare it to the previous five, five years and uh, uh, you know, fire load that we had in the similar years so we can get better in, in predicting what the workload will be. And that's very important for us because in the big fire seasons in Victoria, we, uh, we are the user of, of support from, from other jurisdictions being from uh, interstate, from New South Wales or, or other uh, jurisdictions or from uh, overseas. So, you know, we, we had uh, uh, four times over the last uh, 17 years, we had uh, uh, help and support from the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and we also uh, provided support to uh, other jurisdictions. And then using that information, here is how it's put together through the CRC. Uh, you know, when we uh, indicate what a fire season will, will look like, which is a, a public document then that goes to the uh, bushfire CRC and the APEC here. And, and this is a, you know, the, uh, what we indicated uh, for the last fire season, 2019-20. And unfortunately, if you overlay that with the Stuart's map and, uh, and a map of the area that burned in, in uh, Victoria, we were uh, pretty much spot on. Then the other Stuart talked about the simulators. We we using the other uh, system that was a simulator that was developed through the Bushfire CRC by University of Melbourne, Dr. Kevin Dawhurst, and then used that tool for uh, in a number of ways. So we be using it for uh, strategic planning. So to look how the fires will behave to the landscape depending on the weather events. And then we uh, basically block them, put it inside uh, the, what we're planning to do in terms of the plant burning and other veget vegetation management work and how that will impact development of those fires 
if we uh, put those mitigation measures in place. We also uh, utilize those, uh, those tools for um, the other day before big days to actually look what are the areas where the uh, fire, fire behavior and the impact will be the biggest in, in Victoria. So that helps us with prepositioning of our uh, our troops and aircraft and, and everything else as well. And then we utilize the tool to um, uh, do the predictions where the fire will move uh, once it's ignited. And uh, you know, that helps us uh, to provide, you know, to devise our strategies, tactics, but most importantly, really is to provide that uh, warning to communities in a, in a timely, timely manner. Uh, then the other, uh, other bit is the work that we're doing in a, in a social science space when we're looking at how the people will behave. So depending on, on the fires, the other, how the uh, parts of the communities or the whole communities will, will behave. And then that helps us to uh, you know, put a proper education, uh, you know, the uh, programs in place or to model the behavior of the people so we can, we can see you know, the, if something starts, how long we have to, uh, what will be the reaction of that community, how long it will take us to, to evacuate that community, how likely are, uh, are they to leave before something or as soon as something starts or even before if we've given them the warning that uh, tomorrow is not a good place to, to be at home uh, in, in their particular location. Then also we do uh, work with the communities where we are utilizing the science or bringing the science to communities and discussing with them different things from you know, the, how the fires will behave and potentially impact on their places, how the climate change is impacting on them and, and the changes in the fire risk. And then also trying to build with them understanding of the ownership of that. It's all about the shared responsibility. So it's not just agencies, it's, it's their responsibility as a, a community or as the individuals to undertake certain actions. And then we're trying to get them in a, in a place where we agree on a, on a um, you know, what we're going to do collectively to minimize the risk or what's the plan for that community to minimize the risk, including uh, leave early and not be there in a, in a place on a, on a big fire day. Other approaches that we were working on now is uh, you know, working on, on the suppression effectiveness and um, efficiencies for ground and air resources. Uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work on putting a smart technology on tankers so we can measure some of the effectiveness and all of that with a, with a view that uh, in, a, in a future we'll be far better uh, able to model the effectiveness of, of power suppression resources on, on different fires in different vegetation types under different conditions. So we're working uh, with CSIR on that project and then you know, we're also doing some physical science with CSIRO. We did uh, last year a lot of burning in the croplands to understand how fires behave, you know, the, the speed, but also the intensity of those fires in a, in a different status of the crops, you know, from unharvested to, to bailed. And again, the you other know, that will, if it's significantly different to the grasslands, will feed into the uh, Australian fire danger rating system into the future. Another piece of work that, uh, you know, it's a bit of fun for all of us because we get to, to put things on, uh, on our tankers and then try to burden and see how our protection is, is working on those ones. And I, I have to say that over the last uh, um, 15 years, we, we developed uh, a really good system so for protection for our crews. And it is all about, uh, it, it's a last resort in terms of the defense for, for people, but this is really, they get uh, uh, caught in the equipment. Uh, you know, looking at the uh, study the Stuart was showing before. So how do we prepare our people if they get caught? We, first of all, undertake the training or give them the training so they don't get in, into that situation. But if they are, here is a, a levels of protection. And I, I have to say the system has performed uh, extremely well under, under really difficult conditions. 
this is uh, it is experimental bird, but it was uh, uh, bushfire conditions on a day when it burned. And then the other, and, and I, I neglected to say that most of this work, you, or, or almost all of the work is done not just by CFA, we collaborate and, and work in a partnership with our, our partner agency that looks after the public land here, so Delft and Forest Fire Management uh, Victoria. So uh, they've done a lot of work in, in the CSIRO and Bureau of Meteorology in uh, uh, producing the, uh, the smoke modeling system forecasting system that can be used for um, bushfires, but also for uh, determining you know, the, to undertake or not undertake the plane burning because of the uh, impact of, of smoke on health, on businesses, uh, including you know, the uh, before mentioned uh, vineyards and the products that we all like. Just before I finish, you, you, uh, Matthew, you mentioned that I, I was the president of the International Association of Wildland Fire Management, so I, I better put a plug for the IAWF and uh, uh, sort of uh, ask people to, to really look into the IAWF. It's a fantastic uh, organization that uh, you know, the mission is to, to facilitate communication between researchers between the operational people and, and the communities and it's done through uh, newsletters uh, wildfire magazine or international journal of violent fire but also through the conferences and the next conference that uh, uh, association will run will be uh, in uh, although it is online it will be in north america europe and, and australia in next may and this time it will be a safety summit and human dimensions. So thank you. Thank you, Alan. It's a great presentation. We've had a, a number of questions and I'm not sure we'll get through them all. So um, we will be able to uh, provide answers with um, bundled up with a video uh, that will be written by our panelists. So written answers to some of those questions, but hopefully I can wrap up some of the maybe the more pressing questions that we have here wrapped up into one. And, and I think that gets to the heart, to ma heart of the matter to collaboration and the role of the, the innovations that can be shared between Australia and, um, and France. So maybe Bruno, to you first, I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, clearly there's a, a depth of experience in our collective uh, firefighting teams. How might we best pass on this knowledge to benefit tackling events both here and overseas? And how going forward might, might we best leverage upon the collective innovations of the French and Australian responders through collaboration? And not only that, how do we make it occur quickly? Okay, I got it. So, um, first of all, um, we notice, we notice that we have some similarities with uh, Australia. First, uh, Mediterranean vegetal cover in some areas. Second, use of uh, comparable techniques like uh, backburn, you know, uh, we, we use it as well in France. We have also um, a comprehension of the common system. We use incident common system, especially in South of France. And of course, use of command procedure. Uh, I just heard just before um, uh, how we can, um, I mean, improve a co collaboration. Uh, of course, we want to reinforce a collaboration with Australia uh, in order to uh, exchange of our best practices, in order to uh, learn, of course, with Australia. Uh, it's not only about uh, firefighters. Is uh, with scientists, with uh, researchers, with all stakeholders involved in forest fire. Just one example. Um, I just saw just before in a, in some slide um, the, the the I mean the recommendation for the fire truck. Of course, we are very interested by that because we always want to. Um, uh, we 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 are very aware about the safety of our personnel. So one example of uh, best practice is how you, how you build this truck, um, how is the, the, I mean the scientists or the researchers are involved in uh, um, uh, for build a truck 
but we also are focused on the uh, training program. We want to, to exchange about the training program. We have a very, uh, very new uh, training center in South of France near Marseille. It's very, very new building and we can uh, uh, provide some very intensive training uh, about the forest, forest fire concern. And of course, we want to um, exchange in uh, all the new innovation, like uh, we talk about, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, fire management and risk informed decision making. Uh, it's a very interesting how we can uh, improve our response with mapping, with satellite, with drone. Uh, of course, we have aerial means, but we, we need to focus on drone as well. And that's why we, we would like to, to exchange uh, quickly <laughs> with the Australian colleague. And we will have an international conference uh, on the 7, October 17 in, in Marseille during our Firefighters Congress. Uh, we, we sent already an invitation to our Australian colleague. Um, we will talk about the climate change uh, and, of course, about the forest fire. And in conclusion, uh, forest fire, it's a global problem. So I think we need to have a global approach for all the countries. Thanks. Many thanks, Bruno. Um, Alan, your, uh, your fire truck was mentioned there. Do you have any, uh, any other insights on the potential for innovation exchange um, through collaboration? Plenty of opportunities. You know, every time I, I go um, overseas to international conference or, or attend some of the forums on, online, you see that somebody else is already on a path of discovering something that you just started to think of. So, or somebody is already working on a thing, or started to work on a things that you already have developed fully. So I think uh, globally, we, we're losing a lot of energy going over the same grounds. In, in different jurisdictions, different agencies, and, and the co collaboration between uh, different continents and, and countries will speed up the process. And as we know, the, the funding, especially post COVID-19, won't be, won't be available in, a, in the same way that we, we had in the past. So we will have to work much smarter jointly to, uh, to bring new innovation, new technology, new, uh, new science. So I think it's, it's a fantastic, although it will be an impact on the budget, it's actually to some degree fantastic opportunity to push us all to work much more collaboratively than, than in the past. Thank you, Alan. And, and maybe to you, Stuart, um, before we wrap up, because we don't have much time, I'll ask a specific question about some of the um, technologies and um, innovations that you put into your operational activities. Um, how do you measure the impacts um, of those? And uh, with particular maybe reference to the uh, sharing of predictions with the media, did, how did you evaluate how the impact of those? Thanks, Matthew. That's, yeah, great question. So uh, we're still learning about the impact, but I guess in the immediate time after we put them out, there was really good engagement with the products themselves. So it seems a bit shallow, but you know, lot, lots of tweets and Facebook likes and comments shows Hello? that people were looking we, at it. We, we so they're engaging it with it and saying uh, no that it was useful in helping them make decisions. Um, the, the publication of the maps was also investigated by the New South Wales Bushfire Inquiry. And there were lots of submissions saying that, yes, that, that did help people understand um, the threat, um, whether they were at, th at threat and what they needed to do. Um, and something that will require a bit more research, but um, I'm optimistic that the maps helped, was that if we look at previous fire events, there's, there's a very good correlation between number of houses lost and number of lives lost. And if um, this past season had matched the historical trend, we would have expected to see about 140 deaths. Um, in reality, we saw 26 deaths, which is tragic, of course, but you know, a lot less than we would have expected based on the house loss and the level of fire activity. So um, I think that you know, using predictions, communicating to people did save lives um, just on, on that really um, stark statistic. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you to all the panelists for their presentations and uh, thank you for uh, your time today. 
as I said, um, there are quite a few more questions that the uh, audience have asked and uh, we'll uh, hopefully organise some answers for those um, to match with the video. But now I'd like to hand over to the next session and I believe um, the next host um, is uh, Jean-Baptiste Philippi. So please can I hand over to you and um, look forward to the next session. So hello. Uh, so, so thanks for the first panel and uh, thanks for the, the embassy and Bushfire CRC for this uh, opportunity to, uh, to collaborate and uh, build these collaborations. Uh, the second panel is about wildfire science. So obviously it's all somehow about wildfire science of, of three days, but this, this one is uh, basically on the phenomenon and the, the, the forecast of the phenomenon. We, uh, we are having uh, about five scientists, two, two for France and uh, three from, uh, from the Australia that, uh, that will present uh, some more scientific and uh, technical aspects of their findings. And uh, uh, basically, I will just show uh, what uh, for an initiative before that, which is a Firecaster program. Uh, that is uh, uh, the one funded by the French National Programme on the, or to, to build uh, a, a system which is uh, uh, th that they want to go like the, the one uh, you have in different states in Australia to, to uh, that is an integrated system for fire behavior and uh, fire smoke production. So. Uh, the, uh, to use a, a numerical tool chain. We'll see from the panelists that uh, uh, forest science is uh, going towards more uh, computer intensive uh, fire prediction uh, using a coupled fire atmosphere. And uh, is this, this program is, is about uh, that using high resolution short term forecast uh, for Meteo France, who, who is uh, the, the one that is providing all the forecasts for the, for the command officers. So uh, we, we try as a French community uh, with a transdisciplinary approach to, uh, to make a coherent uh, new forecasting system uh, on uh, high resolution uh, modeling to, uh, to, uh, to have a new kind of uh, fire danger maps and uh, predict fire behavior and uh, coupled fire atmosphere uh, models. Uh, th this is uh, the, we are, as a French community, uh, like it seems at the Australian fire community at, at the verge of uh, making two, two uh, the thermal transfer scientific community and, uh, and the geophysical community, which is basically a bit separated. Uh, and uh, the one is uh, on flame scale fire behavior and the other on the fire atmosphere interaction and uh, smoke production. Those are two communities that does not work together too much uh, in France, and it seems uh, that they are also separated in in Australia uh, somehow. So uh, new kind of projects are building on on the on on the intersection of these two communities. And uh, on the panel today, we have uh, in France uh, Paul Antoine Santani, who, who is uh, who's going to show the forest modeling at uh, the CNRS, who is, uh, who, who is basically uh, uh, leading the group of, uh, of the heat and uh, f f fire safety uh, research. So not very much interested into uh, all the uh, atmos atmospheric aspects. And so then Turkey, who is, uh, is uh, going to talk about all the research done in France on atmospheric pollution. Then the three presenters from uh, from Australia. So the first one is uh, Paul Santoni, who is uh, Paul. Paul Santoni is uh, he's the head of the of the uh, laboratory in Corsica, who is uh, is leading more than 170 scientists uh, in different field aspects, and uh, the most most uh, certainly most importantly the the head of the forest, uh, the, the fire group in France, who is going to speak about uh, now. Paul, c'est à toi. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. So thank you to Jean-Baptiste for this introduction. Thank you to the organizer to leave me the possibility to introduce the research done in France 
at the laboratory. And uh, so I am, um, I am Paul Antoine Santoni from the Laboratory Science for Environment at the University of Corsica, but I am also the head of the CNRS Fire Research Group, which is a group of uh, nine laboratories in France that works on uh, forest fire modeling, but also on the other aspect of fire modeling. So I will speak about uh, our activities. Um, so here you have the different laboratory that work on, uh, on fires. You have in blue the laboratory that work specifically on forest fires from Corsica to uh, Nancy. And then you have in green the laboratory that works on uh, building fires, but some of the laboratory works both on building and forest fires. I will first introduce a different skill for which we tackle the problem of uh, forest fire. So we work first at the micro scale. At this scale, we write equation that can, uh, that are two phase flow equation and uh, that are able to represent the ignition and the paralysis of the material. Then at the meso scale, we work on the different equation that are um, averaged equation that allows us to uh, tackle the problem of a burning shrub or even of a litter. At the macro scale, we keep the same system of equation that we have built at the meso scale, and we can uh, simulate the fire spreading, but to a certain limit of size, which is about 100 meters, and for some hours of uh, spread. And then at the giga scale, we use another type of equation that are simplified model that can be used to simulate the fire spreading at a very large scale, which is the scale of a valley a region, and even to simulate the transport of smoke at long distance. So to summarize, uh, we use knowledge models with as much as equation as possible to simulate all the phenomena involved in fire, smoke, combustion, heat transfer, paralysis, and main, mainly the free laboratory that works on these uh, equations are the laboratory in Corsica, a laboratory in Marseille, M2P2 and a laboratory in Nancy. At uh, the macro scale and the giga scale, we use uh, behavior models that are models that, that have only one or two equations, very simplified models, but that handle the problems with a very large space. And at macro scale, we have mainly USTE, which is another laboratory in Marseille, and our laboratory in Corsica, SPE, that work at GIGAS scale. So in order to present all the problem that we are trying to solve, I will show this curve in which you can see the different steps that lead to the evolution, the development of a fire. We have first the initiation, the fire growth, the developed fire, the fire DC, and the extinction, and the heat release rate, that is to say the power of the fire, follow this curve from a very low value to the main value when the fire is developed. So, uh, at the micro scale, we mainly work on the ignition and on the paralysis of the vegetation. We try to model with very low quantity of mass. You have a, only five milligrams of mass and thermogravimetric analysis. We try to model the development of the way uh, the, the, the wood will decompose into gas and then into char. And then at another scale, which is about 50 grams of materials, we try to simulate the flame. This is the scale of the calorimeter cone that is used in, um, 
building fires. And uh, we try to compare and to validate the model that we have developed at the scale of the thermogrammetric analyzers. So these scales allow us to develop the source term of gaseous fuel, that is to say the paralysis of the combustible solid. Then at the mesoscale, which is a scale where the fire grows, is present and when the fire will develop, we model mainly the convection and the radiation, that is to say the interaction between the flame and the vegetation with the aim to predict the power of the fire, which is the heat release rate of the fire. So you can see on your right a picture with, that represents the radiant heat transfer from the burning fire towards the environment. So you can see different steps, you can see different um, configuration set up. And the first one in blue corresponds to a very small fire when only the gases emit radiation. And then as much as the fire is bigger, you can see that the radiation is more intense when the suits are present also in the flame. So depending on the size of the flame, you have or not suits that are present and the radiation is different. You can see also two examples of uh, modeling at the laboratory scale. So on your left, a knowledge model, that is a model with all the equation that we can have, fluids, combustion, paralysis, radiation, smoke, and on your right, you have a, a simulation and an experiment of the fire across a liter with a modeling, with a behavior model, that is to say a simple model. So on your left, you have the model that you will be able to, to use up to the scale of the macro scale, and on your right, the model that will be able to use up to the scale of the giga scale. You have, this, you have also here an example of a simulation and experiments of what can be do with a mesoscale approach and model uh, behavior model. You can, uh, at this scale, simulate the development, the growth of a fire for instance, in the shrub. Here on your right, you have the, the shrub that is burning, the initiation and the, and the fully development fire, and then the fire decay. And you can see that you can represent the, the flame, but you can also represent the heat release rate that is not shown in this figure. So let's move now to the macro scale. At the macro scale, we are able to develop uh, we are able to, to follow uh, the spreading of the fire and we can do that not only by the modeling but also with experimental setup. We have done in France different experiments to, to follow the fires during prescribed burning. This is one type of experiment setup that was done in Corsica and we have uh, obtained the burning fire for which we have measured the rate of fire spread, but also the fire intensity. One limitation that we have in France with the experiment at this scale is that we cannot perform experiments during the fire season. So all the experiments that we do are only during the, the autumn or during the spring when the vegetation is not so dry. So the maximum rate of spread that we have obtained during this experiment is about 400 meters meter per hour, which is about uh, five times slower than the rate of spread that we can obtain during the summer. So the intensity is very much reduced, but we have fire that are on the same of the size comparable to fire during the fire season, even if they are very lower in intensity. At this scale, we are also able to simulate the spreading of a fire. You, are, you have on your left 
the development of a fire uh, in the in that is nearing a, a house and you can see that uh, with this fire you we are able to to predict the heat transfer that the fire will uh, will have on a wall that is facing the the fire spread so we have done different simulation for instance you can see that if we apply the regulation that is to say if we have the trees that are at a given distance from the wall we have a very reduced uh, heat flux and if you do not follow the regulation if you are outside the regulation you have a heat flux that is very important about 15 kilowatt per square meter so uh, in France, we have also developed uh, at uh, the laboratory M2P2 in Marseille, which is a laboratory that have collaboration with uh, Victoria University in Australia. Um, they have developed uh, Firestar 3D, which is a three-dimensional uh, code of uh, spread modeling, similar to the WFDS code that we are shown in this uh, this picture. Then uh, we also worked at the mega scale. At the mega scale, we have developed two codes. One was developed at the EUST laboratory in Marseille, and the other one at the SPE laboratory in Corsica. On your left, you have a simulation of the SWIFT model that was developed at Marseille for a large fire spread simulation at its peak in Colorado. And on your right, you have the um, simulation of the Meso NH for fire model with um, a, a difference between both approach. The first one is not coupled with a uh, mesoscale uh, atmosphere model, while the four fire approach is coupled with a uh, atmosphere simulation model, which is the Meso NH of French. Uh, model from uh, Meteo France. So, in order to to summarize the challenges that we are facing now in France, but also uh, in uh, in Australia, uh, we have different challenge. That is, the first one is to understand the transition between normal fire and extreme fire events. The, the but one of the main main important problem is the we problem that we are all facing. So I have uh, to stop my presentations, but because I am uh, I have uh, much more more time, uh, I would like to thank you for. And uh, if you have any question, you can chat. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul Antoine. Yes, uh, yeah. I forgot to say uh, each presenter will have a, a ten to fifteen minutes, and uh, if there's no question right now but you can you can ask them by chat and uh, if we have time at the end of uh, each talk he, he can uh, we can answer to this question our next presenter is uh, Solène Turchetti she's uh, she's a professor at Sorbonne University and uh, an expert in atmospheric, atmospheric chemistry she's also the main developer of the of the wildfire emission uh, model Apiflam and uh, as, as that uh, part of the regional chemistry transport model Chimère. She will present today about atmospheric pollution from wildfire. Solène, bonjour. Okay, thanks. Um, so good morning or good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this invitation to speak uh, during this workshop. I won't be able to attend all of it, but I think it's really important uh, that uh, we have more um, collaboration at, at different scale. So here I'm going to talk about uh, atmospheric uh, pollution from wildfires. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start a little bit on uh, why we care about atmospheric pollution and at what scale we are working at uh, in, in this community, this regional modeling community. So of course you are all aware of the um, impact of uh, air pollution. We are working on outdoor air pollution here 
and uh, outdoor air pollution uh, is estimated to cause uh, between four and almost seven million premature deaths per year due to exposure to fine particulate matter uh, and ozone mainly. Among these, a significant fraction is attributed to fires. When we talk about fires compared to other um, emission sources, sorry, I, I forgot to translate this graph here. Um, so this, this small graph is just um, showing um, the, the daily mass of emissions uh, throughout the year for different sources that we are uh, including in air quality modeling. So the um, orange, the, the brown line uh, is anthropogenic, so it varies, but it stays more or less um, uh, constant throughout the year. Biogenic emissions will increase with the, as the vegetation grows, and fire emissions will be very strong peaks, but during very short periods of time. So it's not a background exposure, it's really exposure during specific events. But it's exposure to extremely intense pollution levels. Um, so here I just um, noted two of the pollutants that we are tracking, which is actually many different uh, species of aerosols uh, with a small diameter. Um, the WHO recommendation of the 24-hour mean exposure is to remain lower than 50 micrograms per cubic meter for um, PM10 and uh, during maximum three days per year. Uh, of course, when we are looking at fire events, we are looking at concentrations that are way, way, way higher. This is um, uh, some examples for major fire events. Uh, Russia, Indonesia, Australia. Um, experience, for instance, in Australia, um, the past uh, strong fire season, concentrations were up to uh, 500 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5 in Sydney, so not directly in the fire, in the uh, down within the fire plume during several days. So there is a major um, impact uh, on the population in a very large area. So the intense uh, pollution is uh, strongly linked to meteorological condition, and here uh, these uh, fine particles, these aerosols, will also have a radiative impact that will affect uh, boundary layer and dynamics and can worsen um, pollution. Um, and I will not have time to talk about that a, a lot, but there is a strong link, of course, with meteorological conditions. Uh, in the work that I'm doing, I'm looking at um, quantifying the emissions from these wildfires at the source uh, and uh, then looking at the transport at uh, regional scale. So, in, uh, I'm sure you, all of you must know that, but uh, in, in the, the, the different phases of the fire, the flaming or the smoldering is not uh, the same type of combustion, so it will not be the same amount of trace gases and aerosols emitted during these two combustion uh, types. So during flaming will be more CO2 um, and during smoldering more CO. Uh, for the nit nitrogen compounds, it will also vary uh, with a higher um, NO during flaming from mostly from nitrogen in the soil uh, burning and um, higher ammonia um, during smoldering, for instance. Um, the shape of the plumes at emissions will also be different. Uh, we will have uh, plumes at higher altitudes um, during the flaming phase, and if the fire is mainly smoldering, emissions will be closer to the surface. Of course, for air pollution, this will have a very, very strong uh, impact because it will control the dilution of the plumes uh, in the ventricle and uh, the local impact on air quality. When we, in the air quality community, uh, we are working at scales that are already uh, big for you. So I heard in the pre previous presentation, the mega scale, 
uh, is actually what I would call local scale. So um, we are working at scales at about 5 to 50 kilometer resolution. So at these scales, we will have a mixture of the two uh, phases of combustion together. So we will normally use average numbers and not really care about the flaming versus smoldering, although we really should I think, uh, improve this. Um, so what kind of constraint are we using? We, at this scale, we are using a lot of satellite observations. This will be our first information on the location of the fire. So we will use fire detection. Active fires and burnt scars are now available for different satellites. Um, and fire intensity, the, the, this will be provided by the fire radiative power. Uncertainty on these products is about is estimated to one to five days, so it's really uh, already quite a lot. And um, we tend to have problems estimating the diurnal cycle of the fires, uh, and this will also impact the quality of the, uh, our response. Um, in addition to that, uh, there are several satellite missions that are observing uh, trace gases concentrations and aerosol properties. Uh, this animation shows um, the long-range transport of uh, fire plume from Australia last year, uh, and it shows the carbon monoxide which actually went around the globe. There are um, daily, uh, so the, for these projects is the gas emission, it provides maps twice daily with a pixel size of about uh, 12 kilometers. So that's uh, this kind of observation from this mission or other mission is available for also some nitrogen species. And in this, these plumes are so huge that many other uh, species can be detected. Uh, we are also working with different uh, products that are providing um, vertical uh, mapping of the plumes, uh, showing us a little bit where the plumes were injected, but with a lower revisit time, so we won't have daily observations of it. So in order to complement that, and because satellites are often measuring only total columns, so it would be integrated over the full uh, atmosphere, and of course it's not what people will need for air quality, we are using uh, modeling uh, of the fire plumes. So at LND, we are developing the Apiflam software, um, and so we are trying to estimate the emissions um, for emission uh, and burned area. So we start with a satellite estimate of the area burned, and uh, we estimate also the type of veg vegetation that was burned. Uh, so for this, we are also using satellite data. Each type of vegetation, uh, we estimate the fuel burned, the fraction of this fuel that is actually burned, um, and the emission factor that is specific to the species we want to include and the vegetation type. Uh, and using these information, we are able to uh, calculate, oh, sorry, um, hourly emissions. Uh, this here shows an example for the hourly emissions of uh, carbon monoxide during a fire event in uh, Portugal using uh, geostationary observations. So the software was built to be fully flexible so we can change uh, input databases and it can uh, work uh, at resolutions to, um, down to one kilometer but this is really um, due to the satellite observations that we are using right now. So then, in order to understand the contributions of these uh, emissions to pollution budgets, these emissions are including in a chemistry transport model that is called CHIMED. Um, and uh, we are calculating concentrations of trace gases and aerosols um, that are uh, systematically um, compared to uh, surface in situ and satellite observations. So the Shimmer model that we are working on is used by several air quality agencies uh, in, uh, in France and in Europe. Uh, 
So on the maps on the right, uh, there's an example of a budget um, for PM 2.5, where we see that that's an average for a summer in Europe. And we see that the contribution of the fires is quite low. But we have to keep in mind that the fires were at the most five days long. So if uh, since this was averaged on the full summer, it's uh, during these events a very huge contribution. So with the flexibility of the Apiflam software, we are able to calculate ensembles uh, and estimate emissions. Currently, with the, this is the same for all uh, emission inventories. We are about 100% uh, uncertainty on the emissions. Uh, and this is just the emissions. And in addition to that, we will, of course, have uncertainty on the plume height, etc. Nevertheless, we are able to uh, have quite good uh, information or valuable information, I think, uh, on the air quality impact of the white fires. And I will here show an example of collaboration that we have with the University of Wollongong uh, during the PhD of uh, Geraldine Haya, who spent a few months in Australia. Um, so this uh, was work was done uh, for the fires in the New South Wales region region um, uh, 2013 uh, and the simulation was performed uh, at 10 kilometer resolution. The bar plots show the number of exceedances of air quality standards uh, during the event uh, that were measured at local air quality stations that are mapped on the left and uh, simulated by Chimer. Uh, so what we can see on this graph is that uh, we To, to detect most of the uh, most of the exceedances with just one false alert on the 22nd. So that means that the information was about right, and there were only two uh, missed uh, with miss, missed um, two days. Sorry, with missed uh, peaks. So if we look more closely at uh, what we had. Um, we uh, had, uh, for this case study, um, this network of observation and also the observation at the University of Wollongong that provided us uh, very uh, important information and were uh, used to evaluate the emission factors at uh, really the closer to the fires and for this specific fire event. Also the diurnal cycle that we are difficulty getting from satellite data. Uh, so for um, on these graphs is the, the, the uh, CO and uh, PM10 concentrations uh, daily uh, observed in the black dots and uh, simulated during using different setups of the model in, uh, in colors. And so generally we were able to get the peaks at the right timing. Uh, we have difficulty uh, at this uh, resolution getting the stronger peaks. Uh, and this was identified as problems of uh, transport for this case. So let me, Under higher height. Yeah. Wait. So let we, uh, you, you have one minute left. Uh, okay. And and uh, maybe one question uh, and some noise on your on your microphone that you can not change. Huh? Ah. No, just okay. carry on. I don't know. Mm. I will try to speak up a little bit more. No. Okay. No, so I will not. I will try to wrap up quickly. Um, so in addition to the emissions, uh, there are uh, several act, um, important questions in the community about the chemical production of secondary products uh, during these um, fire events. Uh, so this is true for, this is secondary organic aerosols, which are a, a large fraction of the mass of aerosols. So this is a very active ongoing research, trying to have uh, identify these organic compounds that are emitted and understand how they form aerosols. Um, so I will just skip that. You can look at the slides after. And uh, one of uh, the secondary um, pollutants that are also produced in these fire plumes is ozone. And this is also an active part of the research uh, in, uh, in this area. Um, Thank you. 
Okay, I need to stop now, or can I just show No, no, yeah, show this slide, sorry, yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm slow, I'm a professor, so I'm too slow. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, with these emissions, um, the, I've thought a lot about air quality, air quality monitoring, and uh, exceedances, etc. The radiative impact of these uh, products is also extremely important to better understand. Um, for local meteorology and at larger scale for uh, climate. So this uh, slide shows research done at CNRM um, using the, a global model this time uh, for the year uh, 2019. And there were large uh, events in California, Siberia, and Australia during that year um, with um, uh, extremely large also uh, radiative impact. So for Australia, there was a significant uh, seasonal negative uh, radiative forcing uh, of the smoke, so a cooling uh, at top of the atmosphere over land, but a positive uh, radiative forcing over the oceans. So I will just leave you with the conclusions and you know, maybe more importantly, uh, questions that I didn't talk about, which uh, also, um, wildland urban interfaces were mentioned before. It's also a very important questions for air quality. And I will stop that. Sorry for being too long. Thanks a lot, Solène, for, for, for your talk. Uh, we'll try to have some, some questions maybe uh, at the end of the session if some time is left. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, is uh, Jeff Kepper. He works for the Center for Australian Weather and Climate Research, and is a project leader at Bushfire CIC, he's specialist in meteorology and mostly uh, convection. He's present his study on the pyrocumulus convection. Mr. Keppert, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the work I'm going to present here is um, the work from a large number of people and being in the uh, being meteorologists we tend to look at uh, sort of the meteorological end of the fire science problem so I'm going to show three snippets of work we've done over the last few years one is um, pyrocumulonimbus prediction and the pyrocumulonimbus firepower threshold which is work that's being led by Kevin Torrey Another one is the coupled fire atmosphere modeling, which is work that's been led by Mika Peace. And the third one uh, is ember transport in bushfire plumes and predicting where spot fires can form. So to begin with, um, what is the PFT, the pyrocumulonimbus firepower threshold? When we started thinking about the pyrocumulus problem, we now, people have approached this many different ways. There've been modifications of CAPE, there've been um, you know, fire CAPE ideas like that, various indices. We wanted to try and be a bit more quantitative. And we also recognised fairly soon that there is basically two sides to the problem. There's the fire and there's the atmosphere. And sometimes you can have a very favourable atmosphere for convection and a small fire could produce some cloud. At other times, the atmosphere is very unfavourable. And so we decided the best way to put these together was to define a quantity which was the minimum heat flux, so the minimum power out of the fire that was required for pyrocb to form. It varies with the atmospheric environment. And so to give you an example, this picture shows you a fire that is not producing pyrocumulonimbus. And in this case, it's a small fire and there's insufficient firepower. The second picture shows you a nice example of a fire that is producing a good, strong cumulus cloud. And in that case, it's a larger fire or the threshold is lower, the atmosphere is more favourable and there's sufficient firepower to make cloud. So this is, our, this is our forecast quantity. How do we actually calculate it? We use the ideas that are contained in the Briggs bulk plume model, which is a very simplified model of plume rise. And Kevin did a lot of work analysing that. And by manipulating the Briggs model, he managed to come up with an equation that's shown here, which basically says that the PFT is 
this term, which is pretty much constant, times three variable meteorological quantities. They're the height of free convection, they're the height of free convection, so that's the lifting condensation level squared. The wind speed, that's the mean wind speed within the boundary layer, and the strength of the inversion at the top of the boundary layer. And these things make physical sense. If we've got a high level of free convection, in other words, a very dry boundary layer, that means the plume has to rise higher before we can start to get condensation. That means we need a more powerful fire. If we've got very strong winds, the plume is going to tend to lie down flat. So it is harder for the plume to get to the level at which condensation occurs. And therefore, more firepower will be required to counter the effect, that, to counter the tendency of the plume to lie down close to the ground. And the third one is the strength of the capping inversion. If we have a very strong capping inversion, then the plume is going to need a lot of oomph when it reaches the inversion to break through and produce cloud, and thus it will require more firepower. The real thing that the Briggs model gives us is it tells us that those are the three important quantities, and it also tells us how to combine them. We need the square of the, of the um, level of convection and just the first power of the other two. With these ideas, we can compute maps, and I'll show you a couple of examples here. Here is the Sir Ivan fire in New South Wales a couple of years ago, that's, that's inland of Sydney. And the maps here show on a logarithmic scale, the PFT, which was around 300 gigawatts. Now, the dark colours are low PFT, that's favourable for cumulonimbus. The light colours are high PFT, that's quite unfavourable. And the units are gigawatts. 300 gigawatts is actually quite a high value. Sir Ivan was a very hot fire, um, burning in very favourable conditions in reasonably heavy fuels. And it uh, produced a pyroculum cumulonimbus during the afternoon when that band of more favourable conditions moved over. A second fire down in Lycola, uh, this one, there was an area of high favourability pointed to by the arrow here that was around 10 gigawatts or so. And when that area moved over the fire, we got pyroconvection. You'll notice that both of the areas of favourable um, PFT are associated with wind change boundaries. And we found that to be quite commonly the case. So vastly different threat values in these two cases, but uh, vastly different fire intensities as well. Sir Ivan was much less favourable than Nicola, and uh, but it had a much hotter fire. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a sweet spot argument here. Plumes like cold, moist, calm conditions. They like it to be fairly calm, so they go vertical. They like it to be moist so that they don't have to rise too far before you get convection. Fires like very hot, dry and windy conditions, which are the opposite. And so we actually need, quite often when you've got conditions that are very favourable for fire, it's simply too dry, too windy for con fire convection to occur. And so Kevin's come up with a second modification of the PFT, which attempts to detect this sweet spot. We trialled this modification over the recent summer, and uh, this was done as a, as a science forecasting technique trial. And of course, as you probably know, we got something like 30 PyroCB events over the summer. The technique gave warning of almost all of those. The couple that it didn't quite get were peculiar boundary layers that, um, or fires that were very close to the ocean. And so uh, some of the assumptions were not quite correct and we're working to improve those. So to move on, our next thing that I'm going to talk about is our coupled fire atmosphere model, which sits in ACCESS, which is the Bureau's operational NWP system. The code was originally developed at uh, local universities for the Black Saturday simulations, and we took it over a few years ago. And uh, basically the way it works is like many other coupled fire atmosphere models, the atmospheric model hands 
surface meteorology to the fire spread model, which spreads the fire each time step and hands a calculated heat and moisture flux back. So the case we'll look at here was a fire on Western Australia a few years ago, and this one began on the escarpment south of Perth. So if you look at this um, plan view to the south, we've got the coastal plain out here and then the forested escarpment area. The fire was a lightning ignition out here, and it burned on the first day in the red contours, the second day in the orange, and the third day in the yellow. And we'll just concentrate on the first day here. The spread is quite well predicted. Uh, the spread is overdone when it reaches the coastal plain because the fuel loads that we were using for this simulation were um, too continuous. The, fire the simulation produces a couple of interesting things. Here's a view looking west towards the ocean and you can see the strong updraft from the fire plume. We are just starting to see some cloud forming here in the purple and yellow and that developed into Pyrus CB in the afternoon. That was actually observed and the um, PFT calculation and the model firepower actually agree quite well in these. Another very interesting thing this fire did was both e afternoons as it was burning down the escarpment, we had major ember storms. And on the second afternoon, that ember storm actually destroyed the town of Yaluk, which had a population of about 500. Um, fortunately, there were only two deaths and uh, it could have certainly been very much worse than that. In this part of the world, we often get strong downslope winds develop in the evening. And in this particular case, they set up as the fire reached heavy fuels at the foot of the escarpment. What we're seeing on the right here is two simulations and we've got a plan view at the top with coupled and uncoupled. And then there are three lines shown here, which are the cross sections you see down here. Notice in the coupled run how the downslope winds and the low level jet are both more intense and significantly closer to the surface when we have fire atmosphere coupling on than in the other case. So we've actually got a positive feedback here that the, um, the strong downslope winds which are driving the fire and the uh, associated hydraulic jet, hydraulic jump we believe is contributing to the ember transport. That situation is strongly exacerbated by the heat fluxes from the fire feeding back into the atmosphere. So having mentioned embers, I'll now segue to our work on ember transport parameterization. Um, spot fires are very important in Australian fires in particular. They contribute to fire spread in the case of the uh, Kilmore East fire on Black Saturday, 10 years, 11 years ago, we saw spot fires over 30 kilometers ahead of the main fire front. Obviously that makes fires spread much more rapid and also much less predictable. Spot fires are also strongly, or ember transport is also strongly implicated in many property losses. And a few years ago, we did some work with a large eddy model. Uh, Will Thurston led this to explicitly compute ember transport. And you're seeing an example of that in the movie. This was a very interesting exercise for learning about ember transport, but with the large eddy model at a uh, few tens of metres resolution and explicit ember transport calculations. It was obviously much too expensive for real time use. So the problem we've been addressing more recently is to try and reduce those thousands of hours of CPU time to a few seconds whilst keeping as much accuracy as we possibly can. We've got four ingredients in our fire spread model, in our ember transport model, sorry. We have a mean plume shown up here, which is uh, calculated using a bulk plume model. We have a model of turbulence within the plume, which we developed based on a large number of large eddy simulations with varying boundary layer structures, wind speeds and fire intensities. We have a model of ember transport and ember fallout from the plume, which is the third component. And then once the ember has fallen out of the plume, it falls to the ground and we have a model, a very simple model, it just falls along a slant path that describes that. So if we put those components together, we can compare to the large eddy model. And what you're seeing in these three panels is uh, 
various background wind speeds, seven, 10, and 15 meters a second. The embers all have a fall velocity of six meters a second. The blue curves are the explicit calculations from the large eddy model. The orange dashed curves are the parameterization. And with the, those ingredients, we're getting reasonable agreement between the explicit calculations and the parameterization. What the plots are all of is the landing density of embers on the y-axis, which is a log scale, and the uh, distance from the fire on the x-axis. This enables us to do some interesting things. We can play with different boundary layer structures much more easily than we can with the large eddy model. And we have had a little bit of a play with um, just the sensitivity of thing of um, atmospheric structure to ember transport. We found that inversion height is really important because uh, here are three cases with 10 meter a second winds and these are the parameterized landing distributions for different inversion heights. What happens with a low inversion is the plume hits the inversion, it weakens its updraft velocity and most of the embers fall out at that point, giving you this very rapid fall off in ember density um, as a result. So a low level inversion strongly limits long range transport because it limits the plume updraft. So I've only been able to give you a a taste, a snippet of what we've been up to. I hope it will prompt your interest and you can talk to uh, myself or to my colleagues who are, who are also attending the meeting virtually and find out more about what we're doing. So thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Jeff, and uh, for, for very interesting presentation, Koppel Molding. There's a few questions. You might answer them directly uh, in the chat if you'd like. So uh, we are running a little late. So um, if we, uh, next presenter is Jason, uh, Jason Sharples. And uh, Jason is uh, part of the Applied and Industrial Mathematics Group and, uh, and Computational Sciences Initiative. He's, uh, he's a project leader uh, at the Bushfire CRC on the Spotfire project. He will speak today about complex fire and weather, Jason. Thank you, Jean Baptiste. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to throw a bit of a spanner in the works and give a talk with a completely different title. Um, I think it just follows on from what Jeff was talking about a little bit better. Um, I'm going to focus more on the uh, fire behavioral aspect of the problem, but I will touch on aspects of complex weather and also of fire. So I just wanted to start out with a few definitions just to really try and frame the problem um, a little bit more scientifically. So I'll just start off with the definition here of a blow-up fire. This is a definition that's uh, been around for many, many decades. It comes from the uh, NWC uh, glossary, Wildland Fire. The latest version, I think, is 2018, although there might be a more recent one. So a blow-up fire is something where we're talking about a sudden increase in the, uh, the intensity of the fire, the rate of spread, which is sufficient to uh, sort of spoil our plans about uh, suppression and control. Often, it, often accompanied by violent convection and may have other characteristics of a firestorm. So quite a famous blow up fire event here on the uh, left. This is the, the uh, Storm King Mountain, uh, South Canyon fire, in which 14 wildland firefighters were killed. Um, I guess the thing I wanna point out is just the scale of the event. Um, the photographer standing a few hundred meters away from the fire, uh, the fire is going up into the atmosphere, but not too high. Um, the other thing to point out is that these blow-up events always, almost always occur in connection with some form of dynamic fire propagation. And the, the dynamic fire propagation that sort of appears here uh, straight away is a uh, vorticity-driven lateral spread, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. Just to contrast a blow-up fire with what I'm going to be calling an extreme wildfire, um, you can see straight away the difference in scale. The photographer is now not a few hundred metres back. There are a few tens of kilometres back to get the whole event into the frame. So what we're talking about in an extreme wildfire is a fire which is exhibiting deep or widespread flaming in an atmospheric environment conducive to the development of violent, violent pyroconvection. So the same sort of things that Jeff was just touching on, this, this balance between what the fire is doing and, and what the, uh, the environment is is conducive uh, to. 
extreme wildfires will often uh, end up forming towering pyrocumulus, so pyrocumulus congestus, I guess you could call it, or pyrocumulonimbus. So the real defining feature of an extreme wildfire is that it involves this coupling uh, between the fire and the atmosphere, well above the mixed layer, as you can see in that photograph. And it's that coupling which really acts to modify or maintains the fire's propagation through things like lightning from the pyrocumulonimbus storm itself, but much more um, importantly, I think, just from processes like mass spotting. Just to quickly contrast that with the definition which is in the uh, NWC glossary still, that's the definition of a firestorm. And you can see here, the definition of a firestorm from the glossary is this, again, it touches on this idea of violent uh, convection or pyroconvection caused by a large continuous area of intense fire. So again, it's getting at this sort of fire behavior or this, uh, I guess the, the geometric expanse of the fire across the, across the landscape. Just a couple of uh, important things to note. Um, so I've contrasted extreme wildfires with blow-ups. Uh, generally, extreme wildfires will involve one or more blow-up, one or more blow-up fire events, but not all blow-up fire events are going to develop into extreme wildfires. So the uh, South Canyon fire was a, certainly a blow-up, didn't uh, develop into a, a blow-up event. It was only about 900 hectares, whereas something like the uh, Dunalley event was 20,000 hectares. Not all pyrocumulonimbus events are going to qualify as extreme wildfires. Um, obviously, you've got things which are caused by volcanoes, but even, even if you just restrict to wildfires, you're going to have certain sort of small fires which burn under highly conducive atmospheric conditions which are going to produce a pyro CB, but won't sort of exhibit, you know, exhibit the deep and widespread flaming to the extent that we expect an extreme wildfire to. Just want to quickly touch on this other uh, term, which has been used quite a lot uh, over the last decade or so, the concept of a megafire. I really want to sort of stress that for my sort of way I see things, megafires are quite different than extreme wildfires. They're really um, talking about very large fires which require a large commitment of suppression resources over a long time. Okay, so we're talking about events which last sort of weeks to months. Um, whereas extreme wildfires, we're talking about events which are sort of over and done with within sort of a few hours. So really, um, the way I think about it, extreme wildfires and megafires are not really related beyond the fact that um, megafires may exhibit extreme wildfire characteristics on an episodic basis. And indeed, it's going to be these episodes where a megafire exhibits extreme wildfire characteristics where they're going to do most of their, their damage. All right, so I just want to spend a minute or two on this, um, this plot here. So this is... Uh, some work which was done by colleagues of mine at UNSW and the Climate Change Research Centre. Uh, Giovanni De Virgilio led the work. And what Giovanni did was he sort of said, well, let's have a look at the traditional ways that we've used to assess the risk of extreme wildfires developing. So the traditional measures we have are to look at the surface weather, which is uh, encompassed in the forest fire danger index here, which is plotted on the, uh, the horizontal axis. And one of the measures that we use in Australia to try and assess the uh, I guess the, the lower tropospheric or broader atmospheric conditions uh, that might drive extreme wildfire development is this continuous Haynes index plotted on the vertical axis here. So the points in this plot, um, the red and white ones, are basically uh, 206 fires, which uh, occurred in Southeast Australia between 1990 and 2016. The white uh, symbols are fires which were confirmed as pyrocumulonimbus events. And the red ones are ones which weren't pyrocumulonimbus events, which we'll just classify as standard wildfires, if you like. Okay, so you can see the different red and white colours here signifying which ones um, were pyro CBs and which ones weren't. And you can see that both the FFDI and the C. Haynes alone, and even together to, to some extent, aren't really good at discriminating which fires are pyro CBs and which ones aren't. Okay, they're all sort of mixed in together in this, this region. I mean, you could sort of argue that a C. Haynes above about eight is required, but then you have a lot of these standard wildfires occurring above a C. Haynes of eight as well. Um, in terms of the surface fire weather in the FFDI, we're getting pyrocumulonimbus events forming, you know, even under sort of very high fire danger. The other thing going on in this plot is we've got symbols with different shapes. So the different symbols um, or different shapes 
of the symbols uh, signify what sort of terrain the fires were burning in and the outline, the green or the black, um, signifies what sort of fuels uh, they were burning in. So the green outlines are sort of heavier forest fuels, the black, out black outlines are sort of lighter fuels, shrubs and grasslands. Um, what you'd notice if you look at all the Pyro CB events for you know, the clear majority of them, you're getting a lot of them which are, are crosses and triangles. So this is telling you that your Pyro CBs are occurring more in your more rugged terrain elements. And indeed that's something that sort of popped out as a pattern is that you get these Pyro CBs occurring predominantly in more rugged landscapes and in forest fuels. So what that does is it really takes us back from the, uh, the atmospheric uh, component of the problem and says, well, actually, role of terrain and, and fuel in driving piracy is, is there, and that really suggests that fire behavior, okay, terrain and fuel are two sides of the wildfire uh, triangle. So it really suggests that wildfire behavior is gonna be an important in uh, whether you develop a piracy or not. So this is something that which was picked up in, in earlier work. Um, so some work we did with Rick McRae from ACT Emergency Services, looking at um, a couple of uh, pyroaccumulonimbus events back in 2006 in the Blue Mountains, we were able to just demonstrate that you always had this, uh, this link between regions of what I'll refer to as deep flaming. That's really just that continuous expanse of flame that you were just talking about in the, uh, the definition of a firestorm from the glossary before. So it was really this spatio-temporal link between having regions of deep flaming occurring, which were driven by episodes of dynamic fire behavior, and these centers of strong pyroconvections, um, which in this case produced uh, pyrocumulonimbus events. Um, this link was further confirmed by some numerical work my postdoc, Rachel Badlin, has been doing over the last few years uh, using a, a coupled uh, fire atmosphere model. So there's just a, a couple of snippets of Rachel's work. So here she's just looking at three different fires. Okay, so this fire here has a circular shape, one kilometre radius circle, so a big, big fire in the shape of a circle. Uh, this one here is a rectangular fire, okay, four to one ratio rectangle. And then this one here is another rectangular fire that's a lot skinnier, so 64 to one ratio. So the idea is that this sort of fire shape is more akin to your expansive area of active flaming. Whereas this one over here is more akin to your ordinary frontal fire behavior, so a fire line. What you can see though, is when you have the uh, deep flaming scenarios, the plume gets a lot higher up into the atmosphere. Okay, so the blue line here is the, the tropopause. Um, so for both these fires, the, the plume is getting up into the tropopause, or above the tropopause, up in the stratosphere. And for this one, it's not getting anywhere near the, the tropopause. The important thing to point out with these, um, these simulations is that the total power of the fire is the same in each of these uh, three cases. So this is really suggesting that um, it's the way that the fire power is configured spatially is also a very important factor. All right, so if we think of it that way, then trying to understand which fires are going to develop into extreme wildfires really comes down to saying, well, we need to understand the uh, atmospheric component but we also need to understand the potential for the fire to exhibit this deep flaming sort of behavior. So we've kind of singled out sort of a rogues gallery here of six different triggers. We sort of have good confidence are, are capable of producing deep flaming. Uh, some of them are fairly standard, like strong winds and wind changes. These last four though, and I've added this, this uh, last one here just recently, overzealous use of incendiaries, so that's sort of back burning under the wrong sort of conditions. Um, these last four all involve uh, dynamic fire propagation. So what I mean by dynamic fire propagation, I've mentioned it a few times, I haven't explained myself. Dynamic fire propagation is when you have your fire being driven by feedbacks between the fire and the environment and also between different parts of the fire itself. And, you know, basically the sort of traditional fire spread models that um, relate rate of spread to specific uh, environmental conditions kind of no longer apply. The other nasty thing about dynamic fire propagation is that it's subject to threshold behavior. So you can very quickly go from conditions which don't support dynamic fire propagation to conditions that do. The nasty thing about it is that we currently don't really have very much in the way of operational capacity to be able to account for these sorts of behaviors. It's something we're working on uh, through the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC and with collaborators at CSIRO, for example. 
Um, if I had more time, I could sort of step you through each of these dynamic fire behaviors, but I don't. So what I want to I do- I think we yeah, just have maybe less than a minute left. So thanks. Oh, very quick, two more slides. So I'm just going to concentrate on, on vorticity driven lateral spread because I think this is a, a new one and I think it's the most important one too. So vorticity driven lateral spread, this is just a little cartoon that I put up to try and explain what's going on. What happens with vorticity driven lateral spread or VLS is you have an ignition, the fire will burn up the hill just normally, but once it gets to the ridge top, if the lee slope is steep enough, the fire will actually spread across the wind, okay, laterally across the slope. As it does that, it's highly turbulent and will throw um, embers off and start creating these spots. These spots will then uh, coalesce and form these regions of deep flaming. So that's my cartoon version. Um, this is what the real thing looks like. Uh, this is the green water fire um, back in December last year. And you can see you've got the, uh, the fire advancing uh, due to VLS on the flank here and the embers being caught up in the plume and being deposited downwind coalescing, forming these uh, deep flaming regions. Very last thing I just wanted to touch on leading the Martyrs slide is the role of fuel moisture, okay? Because um, spotting plays such a critical role in the development of deep flaming, fuel moisture is an important part of spotting. And you can actually see how this played out in uh, the uh, fires we had in Southeastern Australia over the last season. What I've got here is um, critical fuel moisture anomaly, if you like. Red is critically dry, blue is not critically dry. And the spots here uh, coincide with instances of pyrocumulonimbus uh, development. And so you can see where you're getting the pyrocumulonimbus um, formation pretty much exclusively corresponds to when you've got critically low fuel moisture. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jason. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for the talk. There are a few questions that you, you, you might answer about uh, directly in the chat about embers and spotting you uh, and Mr. Kepert. Uh, the, our next speaker is Marta Yebra. She, she will link with uh, the, your last slide on, on fuel moisture. Marta is a senior scientist at the Center for Water and Research Dynamics at the Australian National University. And uh, most of our research is on remote sensing for monitor and uh, quantify and forecast natural resources. She will speak today about remote sensing and flammability of landscape. Marta, do you need me to pass your slides? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, while he put my uh, slides up, I'd, I would like to start just uh, to making the point that uh, effective adaptation to extreme fire events and an increasing challenging fire management situation that we are seeing worldwide requires accurate and timely data to inform decisions. And remote sensing technology uh, has a huge potential uh, given the temporal and the spatial coverage of the data collected by sensors in multiple platforms. So this uh, diagram here uh, we published recently in our report uh, describe uh, the information required to support critical decision making uh, during all fire management phases, pre, during, and post-fire. And in the different colors, uh, the types of remote sensing platforms currently used uh, to observe uh, these uh, variables in, in Australia. So given the time today, I, I, even though we do research across all these areas, I'm going to focus mainly on the work we have done under the umbrella of the Pushfire Natural Hazard CRC on the use of remote sensing data uh, or mainly on board of space uh, platforms to derive uh, special information on fuel flammability. So fuel flammability is, is determined uh, by fuel quantity or load. Uh, this is all life and their vegetation that accumulates over time and can potentially burn. And it's arrangement, uh, this is uh, the, origin, the horizontal or the vertical uh, continuity and its most to content is also very important determinant of flammability. So for example, when fuel moisture content is high, there is less chance of a fire igniting. Fuel that is separated is less likely to carry fire and more available fuel means uh, larger frames and greater fire intensity. Uh, for example, uh, more specifically, there is observational evidence for an effect of live fuel moisture content on fire spread rate, and this figure shows last, that. And last fire season in Australia, we show significant uh, fire activity in, in fuel arrangements dominated by life components. 
on the other figures on your um, on your right, uh, we can see that most two variations of grassland and shrublands. Uh, this specific study is done in the in in Spain. In Spain, if you haven't worked it out, I have a Spanish background. Have also been found uh, to be good predictors of of the number of fires and the total burn area and the occurrence of large fires. So also the uh, predictions of probability of house loss indicate uh, that for a house uh, surrounded by a given percentage of trees uh, and shrubs, uh, this is indicated in, in the x-axis uh, here, uh, the, the main uh, probability of house loss uh, that is shown in the y-axis is less uh, where vegetation surrounding the house have higher values for average NDVI. And the NDVI here is an index that has been used in this study as a proxy of vegetation moisture co content, and it decreases from your left uh, to the right in these three panels in this slide. So because of the importance of live field moisture content, uh, we developed the Australian Flammability Monitoring System, and this is the first uh, algorithm and website in Australia that uses satellite data to collect information on live field moisture content. It then displays this information on an interactive map, as I will show later on, and this helps fire managers, for example, scheduling and planning their prescribed burning efforts and prepositioning of firefighting resources uh, based on the flammability of, of the landscape. So here I just show a screenshot of the public website. Uh, you can basically search for any location and time. And uh, we also display in black uh, the total burn extent reported by the emergency authorities at a given time. And the red flames are the active fires at that given time as well. So in this specific screenshot, uh, as an example, I shared for the fuel most to content maps uh, during a fire that happened near Canberra on the 25th of January. Uh, and as you can see, the fuels uh, were very dry uh, that day, and this is indica indicated by the red colors. And to give you an idea of the extent of the dryness, uh, I have done also another screenshot. You can go to the next slide, um, please. Uh, go back, sorry, it's not that. Uh, all right, it's lost, no, no problem. So basically I put the same map in 2011 and we could see that map was completely blue. So you can trust me that that was the case. So in this slide, um, I show uh, the work we did using this satellite data product to evaluate uh, what were the key drivers of the scale of the area burned during our last fire season in Australia. And uh, the data corroborated that the dryness of the landscape, landscape was one of the key uh, drivers explaining uh, how fire activity um, was so, so high in Southeast Australia. So on your left here, you can see that nationally fuel was the driest uh, seen at least uh, 2000, that is our satellite records. And on your um, right, you can see that when we focus on the southeast forest, um, uh, we, we have a similar story. So here I show the, the average fuel moisture content for forested areas in southeast Australia. Uh, and the black line uh, represents the average fuel moisture content for those areas from 2000 to 2018. And in blue, the values for the last five seasons. And sorry, I haven't updated uh, this figure. Uh, but you can see how clearly uh, those values in, in the blue line were lower. So the current system we have developed provides near real-time information, uh, which is up updated every four days at 500 meters spatial resolution, and that's the map on the left. This spatial resolution is limited for uh, detailed uh, bushfire management planning. And we are working with Geoscience Australia to develop an operational data production and delivery system that uh, produces a much higher resolution, live field moisture content maps using the European Space Agency's uh, uh, Sentinel-2 imagery. So on the right, uh, you can see an example of a 10 meters spatial resolution fuel moisture content map for an area, uh, the same area presented before near Canberra. And in comparison with the current capability on the left, these higher resolution maps give you more detailed information of topographic uh, driven fuel moisture content differentials. And um, 
And yeah, this is essential for some planning uh, and management activities. So we have also adapted the satellite-based algorithm um, to produce a fuel moisture content in Europe uh, to be used uh, in, uh, in the Joint Research Center's uh, European Forest Fire Information System. And uh, I am now working with some colleagues uh, from the Spanish uh, National Research Co Council, that's the SIC, uh, to analyze uh, the effect of the live fuel moisture content dynamics using this satellite product on wildfire occurrence in Europe. And uh, the idea is to find the critical live fuel moisture content threshold values that influence uh, burn area and frequency in Europe. So just uh, quickly moving to fuel load and arrangement, uh, I'm not going to present today, but we have done a lot of work on the use of LiDAR data to, to derive a very accurate information of fuel loads and arrangement. Uh, but also, unfortunately, uh, that detailed information cannot be directly ingested in most of the currently operational fire behavior models in Australia. So consequently, I have spent quite a bit of work, uh, time working with some colleagues uh, on trying to use satellite uh, data, for example, Sentinel-2 and Landsat, to derive uh, proxies of fuel load uh, that are used in most operational fire behavior models. And this is an example of the use of Sentinel-2 data uh, to map fuel aid um, in, the, in your left uh, bottom image. And as you can see, uh, that gives you a lot more detailed uh, information uh, that uh, what currently uh, methods based on fire history that are shown on the top image uh, that assume a uniform uh, fire severity and vegetation recovery in red. So in collaboration with CSIRO, uh, we have used uh, these maps as inputs in fire behavior models uh, using the Spark uh, toolkit uh, obtaining information about the most uh, likely spread of a fire after an ignition is detected. So just my last slide to summarize uh, my contribution. So yeah, it, it is obvious that we require accurate and timely information and remote sensing data has huge uh, potential to provide, for example, information about fuel uh, flammability, but uh, this data is still no use at full potential in fire management, I would say. And this is mainly due to the fact that it's not directly ingested into current operational system. So we are here for collaborations and what I see as future research and development uh, that needs to be done is um, to yeah, more research into converting this uh, information into secondary variables more easily to be implemented into fire management decision and also to collaborate with fire behavior models uh, developers uh, to be able to incorporate this detailed information derived from satellite data into those uh, future generations of fire behavior models. And that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marta. And uh, thanks for the talk and, and for being, uh, for keeping your time. So we are now on time for the wrap up session. Uh, which is just uh, now. Is there, uh, do, do we have some time for, for some questions directly there? Or we will handle them in the wrap up session that is just after. Thanks for all speakers for the tomorrow, this morning. Hello, so, uh, so thank you for uh, this great session and all the, the presentations. Uh, it's been a, a very useful discussion on both uh, doctrines and uh, efforts at uh, improving uh, uh, fire predictions. We, we, we've seen the need for uh, further collaboration between France and Australia, and that will be the topic of our discussions during the, the day uh, two and three. Um, thank you for participating in today's session. We hope you found it informative. We look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, it's Australia time, 8 a.m. Uh, France uh, time for the session on risk reduction and new challenges. And our third day will be uh, dedicated to opportunities for collaboration. Thank you.